Hello and welcome back to my channel and today's Christmas special which is ranking the James Bond movies. That's the official series of Bond movies, uh, not including Casino Royale, the rather silly uh, comedy film with Peter Sellers and Woody Allen and so on which is pretty dreadful, and Never Say Never Again which came out in the early 80s with Sean Connery, which I liked at the time when I was about 12 years old, mostly because of Barbara Carreras if I'm honest, but which I don't like so much now. So we're going to count down the official series. Now I've watched quite a few of these uh, Bond rankings on the internet and I've realised something watching them is, and that I'm not really a proper James Bond fan. I don't take it that seriously. I never read the Ian Fleming novels. I don't really see it as this serious action movie franchise. When people talk about the film franchise James Bond, I get a bit weirded out, you know. I don't take these films very seriously. For me, they mean my youth, they mean my boyhood. You know, Christmas holidays, New Year bank holiday, Easter bank holiday, Whitson bank holiday, they were always showed a Bond movie. And it's one of these weird things about British popular culture, you know. It's like the Hammer movies, like the Carry On films, the Bond films, they're all the same. You seem to have seen them all without really trying. You know, you actually make an effort to watch other movies, right? But with Bond films, I'd seen them all just because I had. They just happened to be on every, you know, bank holiday or boxing day or whatever, so I just watched them. And I've actually seen all of them somehow over the years. I'm not really knowing how. It's the same with the Carry On movies. And to me, the Bond movies are not a film franchise. They're cultural wallpaper. They're part of being British. They're the landscape of British popular culture. People sitting in front of their TVs, watching something on a cold bank holiday day, you know, after a big lunch. I just, I, I find it weird to see them as individual good movies, you know. To me, the closest analogy to what a Bond film does is Bollywood, in a way. I think James Bond is British Bollywood. It's more like a spectacular that contains all sorts of elements. So, it, like, Bollywood is, is, a, is a vehicle for music, for the songs and the dance, well, James Bond is a bit like a musical, and it starts with a musical, doesn't it? It has the big song with this weird animated sequence, that's all part of it. And then it has little moments of, you know, action and excitement that are crazy stunts and all sorts of all sorts of things going on. You have a sexy guy at the centre of it with loads of sexy women around him. You have lots of gadgets, you have lots of clothes that you can wear or find fashionable. And they go to exotic places, don't they? They go to Rio or Venice or Thailand. You know, I think we've forgotten what was the original appeal of these movies. When I was young and I said to my parents, why do you like watching Bond movies? It wasn't the action sequences. It wasn't any of that stuff. What they liked was they said, well, it's because he goes to places that we'll never go to. This was the days before package holidays, before cheap flights. People were never going to go to Venice. They were never going to go to Egypt or North Africa. They were never going to go to Australia. These were far off exotic places. And that's what people liked about Bond. It was a dreamscape. It's not a real action franchise about a real character. I mean, people get upset about Bond because it's like, oh, British cultural imperialism. It's ridiculous. It's a nonsense character in a nonsense universe. The British intelligence doesn't matter a toss anymore. No one cares about that. It's the fun element of it. And also the other year, I was at the Bologna Film Festival in Italy, and they had a they had a restoration of Doctor No, the very first Bond film, and it was so interesting to me to watch this movie as a modern audience member. It starts off, and there's Sean Connery, and he's, he's in a casino, you know, and he's looking very cool, and this very beautiful, highly coiffured, beautifully dressed woman comes up to him and goes, "Who are you?" And he goes, "Bond." James Bond. And then the music starts. And then they have this little scene. And what you realise is, there's nothing particularly fantastic about saying Bond, James Bond. It's not particularly witty or brilliant. But it felt cool, right? And it just occurred to me that if you were in 1962 England, right, in a crappy cinema on a grey day with rain outside, what you're watching is glamour. You're watching a dream. And what you're watching is a sophisticated man talking to a sophisticated woman. This is how you chat up a sophisticated woman. This is how to be cool. This is how to be debonair, right? That sense of dream and aspiration and fantasy, 
That's what really powered the Bond series along. It wasn't whether it was well plotted or, you know, it was a brilliant action movie that, you know, had its characterization went this and that. That's all bollocks. It it was it was about the fun. You were entering into this this wonderfully plush, sophisticated dream where all the men were sophisticated and all the women were sophisticated and all the clothes they wore and the watches they wear and all the, the cars they drive are all fantastic. That's the real appeal of Bond. It's a dreamscape. It's a fun playpen for our imaginations. And that's kind of how I still see it. I still see Bond as being a bit of fun, really. So bear that in mind as we go through my top, my 25 ranking. You might be surprised at where some films fall. So at number 25 is A View to a Kill. I think this is really the bog end of, of James Bond. I mean, even with Christopher Walken and an airship above Golden Gate Bridge, you know, two of my favourite things, Christopher Walken and airships, even that cannot save this film. Yes, Roger Moore was too old and he's pretty crappy in this. The scene with him and Grace Jones in bed is lethally embarrassing. I remember wincing at it when I saw it at the cinema back in the 80s. And this is probably the worst film of the series. A little thought as we go through this list, uh, sort of thinking off the top of my head. The more Bond is involved with America and the United States, the less good the films are. We'll test that theory out as we go through, but I'll just leave it there. At number 24, Die Another Day. And you'll notice this is another last film. Another theory of mine is that the last films of each Bond are always among the worst Bonds. And Die Another Day, my God, this is awful. I mean, you don't need to tell me why. I mean, Toby Stevens, probably the worst villain in the history of the series. When Halle Berry is the best thing in a movie, you know you've got problems. And that's all I want to say about Die Another Day. Number 23 is Diamonds Are Forever. Again, the last Sean Connery movie. Great song. It's all downhill from there. And again, mostly set in America. I don't know what it is. America and Bond just doesn't seem to fit for me. Diamonds Are Forever, I just don't like the tone of this film, you know. I mean, Charles Gray's a decent actor, but he's a bit insipid as the villain, I think. But it's the tone, it's a sort of got a sarcastic, laconic, can't be arsed tone. You know, Sean Connery seems a bit like he's bored now and he's just going through it for the money. And the whole movie has that kind of feel. And there's other elements in it, like the sort of the sort of slightly, slightly homophobic, you know, duet of those two guys, the two obviously gay characters who are the villains in it. I don't know, it seems it leaves a bit of a nasty taste in the mouth, this movie. I've never been very fond of it, but it has got a great song. 22, now we're going in, those are the three that I really actively dislike, right? We're now going into what the internet people call meh, you know, M-E-H, sort of not that bothered. So at number 22 is For Your Eyes Only. I always thought this one was a bit boring. It starts off with a weird scene where Roger Moore drops Blofeld. Blofeld's on a wheelchair and he drops him down a cooling tower. The most bizarre scene in James Bond. And then after that, it gets really dull. And uh, the, the climax is this long climb, climbing sequence, which I think goes on a bit too long. Never really bought into Topol as a villain. You know, a bit dull. Number 21, The Living Daylights. The Living Daylights comes low down on my list for one simple reason. I cannot remember a sodding thing about it. I really, honestly, I'm sitting here, I can't remember much about it. I remember the Bond girl in it, Mariam Darbo, was very irritating. I remember liking the song when other people didn't like the song. It was by Aha, and that's your lot. I know that there are some James Bond fans out there who rave about Timothy Dalton and say that actually he's a misunderstood genius, you know, he sort of took the character into a darker place, Mike. It was so interesting. No, it wasn't. It was boring. It's forgettable. I'm sorry. I know that, that is heresy amongst many James Bond fans, but he just didn't do it for me. He's a good actor, likeable guy, not James Bond. Number 20, Thunderball. Never got on with this one. Uh, there was some good music composed for it by John Barry, but um, never really got on with it. Another pet theory of mine. The closer James Bond gets to the water and undersea sequences more boring it gets. There you go, that's another theory for you. So Thunderball never really got on with this one, and I can understand why Sean Connery allegedly wanted to remake it with Never Say Never Again. 
Number 19, Man with a Golden Gun. This isn't very good, is it? With a terrible song by Lulu. But I put it above the others simply because of Christopher Lee and also because I love the bass. You know, the evil villain's bass on that beautiful rock on the beach in Thailand and that sort of mirror dish comes out the top. I'd love to live there. You know how we all secretly want to live in a Bond villain base. That's the one I'd like to live in. So that's why it comes 19th on this list. I, they're my reasons. You, know, you can have your own reasons. Number 18, Goldeneye. Now, I understand that this is very popular amongst Bond fans, particularly people who like Pierce Brosnan. I've never been the greatest Pierce Brosnan fan. Um, I thought it was fine. I remember going to see this at the cinema. But you know what? Goldeneye, to me, it all works. I, I admit that the thing I most remember is Famke Janssen and her thighs. But, you know, forget that. Um, the thing about Goldeneye is it feels like someone sort of doing a fake James Bond film. You know, so you get the Tina Turner song at the start. Sounds like someone trying to do Shirley Bassey. It doesn't sound like a new original song, but someone trying to imitate something else. The whole film feels like that for me. It feels like an imitation James Bond film. A very good one, and a very enjoyable one. But it feels imitation. It's not the real McCoy somehow. I can't really explain it. It just... It, it, it felt like a sort of fake fur coat. That's how I would describe it. And number 17, Spectre. This was a movie that I was very down on when I first saw it. I thought it was a bit of a bore. I went back and watched it with my mum, of all people, uh, recently. You know what? I was being a bit harsh on it. It looks nice, like all the Daniel Craig films. It looks gorgeous. Leah Sadoo is very good. And I quite enjoyed watching it. It's not one of the best Bonds. It never will be one of the best Bonds. But it's okay. It's in the sort of mid-range. Number 16. Now I'm going to get a lot of flack for this. Crimes. Don't all hate me at once. The Spy Who Loved Me. I know. I know everyone says this is the best Roger Moore James Bond. And I like Roger Moore. I defend Roger Moore, right? I know everyone says this is the best one. I know this is Alan Partridge's favourite James Bond movie. It just doesn't do it for me. I don't know why. I find it a bit boring. Again, Water. Remember I said that? Kurt Jürgens is dull as the villain. You know, Barbara Back is good and that sort of interplay between her and Roger Moore is okay. Jaws is in it. Isn't, isn't it Spy Love Me where there's a scene where you're supposed to be really tense when you're watching two little blips go like that and they pass each other? Really? Is that the best you can do? I don't know. I, I, I know that everyone says this is the best, one of the best Bond movies. It's never done it for me. I wish it did. It just, it's a bit meh again. Number 15, Octopussy. Now, I know that this is a much derided film. I actually quite enjoy it. I have to confess, I like all the circus imagery. I, lo I love that beginning, the sort of surreal thing where that British agent is dressed as a clown and gets killed. I like the fact that it's got Stephen Burkoff in it. A lot of people get really irritated with Stephen Burkoff. He's one of my favourite bad actors. You know, I mean, he's so over the top, isn't he, Stephen Burkoff? So ridiculous. I quite like him as the villain. Um... I, I, I accept that it's not everyone's favourite Bond movie, but I get some entertainment out of it. Sorry. Number 14. OK, I'm really going to get some flack for this. Quantum of Solace. Now, most people put this in their bottom three. I've put it at 14. Why? I have a secret liking for this movie. And the reason is this. I know, I totally accept that this movie has one massive problem. And that is that the action sequences are terrible. They're massively over-edited. You can't really tell what's going on. And in, a, you know, in an action movie, that's a bad thing, right? But the reason I like this movie is, you have to understand, I'm a wanky art film lover. You know, I like Antonioni. I like Rossellini and Tarkovsky. You know, I like kind of wanky art house stuff, right? And this is the Bond movie for wanky art house people like me. The way that the film is shot, it's gorgeous. It looks gorgeous. You know, I love the ending. You know, any ending of a Bond movie set in a, in a hotel that looks like something out of Zabriskie Point, I'm there. You know, it has a sequence set at a modernist staging of Tosca, the opera. You know, it's got, you know, it has this scene set at the beginning in, in is it in uh, Siena in Italy with the horse race around the square and all that sort of stuff. I might have got the wrong Italian city there, sorry. But I love all that stuff. It's very pretentious, it's very wanky, and I quite like it. I, the, only, the other complaint I have about this movie is there's not enough Gemma Arterton in it. You can never have enough Gemma Arterton, can you? But Quantum of Solace is a bit of a guilty pleasure of mine. Number 13. What have I got down as number 13? Oh, yeah. 
No Time to Die. Bit of a mess, isn't it? No Time to Die. It's a bit of a mess. I'm not sure I really go along with the way they killed off Bond. There's a lot of elements that don't work. You know, I don't like all the bringing back of the old stories into... You know, I like the Bond films to be discreet. Just get on with it. I don't have to have backstory and context and themes and threads. That gets on my nerves. And the addition of the, the other 007, the female agent, who is, is just completely gratuitous. It doesn't add anything to the film at all. And she's not a very interesting actor. So I've put it at 13, though, because A, I love the look of it. Beautiful cinematography. You know, I, I love that kind of thing. All of the Daniel Craig movies are so beautiful to look at. I think him and Leah Sadu go really well together. I think they're a good central couple. And um, I like that fantastic end action sequences when he's going up the stairs. You know, when he's going up those stairs and he's shooting, it's all done in one shot, or seems to be done in one shot. That's beautiful. I like that very much. Number 12, Licence to Kill. This is the best of the two Timothy Dalton movies. And I think on its own terms, I think this movie works really well. I remember enjoying it very much when I saw it at the cinema in 89. It's a very good action movie with two very lovely uh, co-stars for um, Timothy Dalton, who seemed to stay in my memory for some strange reason. Um, the reason why Licence to Kill is not in my top ten is because it's a good action movie, Licence to Kill, and that's all it is. To me, Licence to Kill is like any other action movie from the 80s or early 90s. And I don't want Bond to be like any other action movie. I want it to be James Bond. I want it to have that special mix, that special feel. Licence to Kill feels like any other movie made at that time. It's very good. You know, it's very well acted, it's very well paced, it's very well directed, good action sequences. But it doesn't have that special Bond flavour, which I like. And that's why it's not in my top ten. Number 11 is The World Is Not Enough. Um, I think this is a really good little movie. This gives you everything that you want from a Bond film. I love the central concept, the um, Sophie Marceau and Robert Carlyle, this kind of twisted love affair at the centre of it, which is played very well. Um, and it's a good story with some good sequences. It's well paced. I think Pierce Brosnan is quite good in it. It, it, Brosnan is very good at the action and tough stuff, not so good at the emotional stuff, I noticed, but he's quite good at the tough stuff. This movie gets a lot of uh, flack because of Denise Richards, but, I mean, you know, come on. Sort of uh, oddball Bond girls turning up randomly is what James Bond is all about, so it doesn't really disturb my pleasure. Um, one thing I'd like to say about The World Is Not Enough, the song is very good, very underrated. I like the opening sequence very much. So let's get into the top ten, and at number ten is Tomorrow Never Dies, my favourite of the Pierce Brosnan set. As I said, I'm not the greatest fan of Pierce Brosnan, but this one's a really good one, and I love the idea of it, that he's basically the Bond villain is Rupert Murdoch, right? He's this kind of media magnate who's sending out fake news into the world. And I think that's a very good idea, well played by Jonathan Price. I think the addition of Michelle Yeoh as a Bond girl is ingenious, she's great, a terrific sort of action star in her own right, and I think she really adds something to it. Again, not enough Terry Hatcher, but that's a minor uh, problem in a very, very good film. Number nine, From Russia With Love. Now, I understand that amongst, you know, serious Bond people, not like me, this is regarded as one of the best, if not the best. That kind of surprised me. I didn't realise this movie was so admired. It is very good, it does its job very well. Um, I just didn't think it was one of the absolute best. Um, you know, Robert Shaw is very good as the villain, and there's not enough of him, really, to be honest. As a kid, I always used to remember the woman with the, the dagger in her shoe more than Robert Shaw. Um, Daniela Bianchi is very lovely as the Bond girl. And is it my imagination? Um, or isn't she nude? Isn't this the one moment in a Bond film where you have a, a full frontal nude? I was uh, shocked. I was, I was outraged by it. You know, I mean, she is through a veil, through a curtain, but, I mean, well, it's there. Outrageous. Let's move on to number eight. Uh, and the very first um, Bond movie, which is Doctor No. Um, you know, Doctor No is complete... It's complete over-the-top nonsense, isn't it? But it still works. You know, all the elements in it still work. Bond, Connery's performance as Bond is sublime. He gets it straight away, and he absolutely embodies the character, and still, arguably, I think, is the best Bond. And he's very good in this film. I think his performance is underrated. Um, Ursula Andress is the perfect Bond girl, as Alan Partridge would attest. And, uh, 
you know, you've got a nice slimy cold villain with a great base and that weird bit where the boat comes along belching fire. It all works and I still think it's a very entertaining movie. It has dated in some elements. It has. But I still think it gets the Bond formula really good from the beginning. Now, at number seven, you see, this is where I show my true self, right? This is where serious Bond people might get cross with me. But at number seven is You Only Live Twice. I love this movie. I mean, look, Donald Pleasant's in a volcano base. I don't need to say anything more. Why do we need to have any more conversation? Donald Pleasant's sitting there with a cat and a little scar on his eye, and he's in a volcano base where people come down on ropes from the crater of the volcano. You don't need any more than that. But on top of that, you've got them trying to make Sean Connery look Japanese, which is hilarious. Brilliant. Then you've got Little Nelly, the helicopter. I love that. This was one of my favourite movies as a kid. I adored it. You know, sometimes we forget the, the genius of James Bond and how some scenes can be genuinely disturbing. We forget that as we get older. When I was a kid, one of the scenes in James Bond that most made an impression on me was, do you remember in this film, there's a bit where they drip some poison down a hair and they're dripping it into the bedroom where Bond is sleeping with his girlfriend and then he rolls over and he goes into her mouth? That is one of the scenes that most stays with me, as well as the little helicopter and Donald Pleasance. This movie, for me, was a blast. Great song. Everything about it I loved as a child. I used to look forward to re-watching it. And it's still one of my personal favourites. Number six, Casino Royale, the Daniel Craig, um, where they tried to make Bond grow up, didn't they, really? They tried to reboot it, take it back to its original, uh, serious, well, half-serious nature, and give it a bit of bite and a bit of, you know, a bit of anger. Craig immediately impressed me as Bond. He's become my second favourite Bond after Connery. Um, and he's very well supported by Eva Green and Mads Mikkelsen, who's always a favourite actor of mine. I think this is a very good, solid, well-directed film. Um, and a very good start to the whole Daniel Craig era, which I've grown to like a lot, actually. Number five, Goldfinger. Now, Goldfinger, we all know the great elements of Goldfinger, don't we? We know Shirley Bassey's song. Again, going back to what I was saying about the poison, that brilliant scene at the beginning with Shirley Eaton covered in gold paint. We forget just how incredibly strange and surreal and disturbing that moment is. It's a brilliant piece of cinema. And the first time you see it, it's like knockout. When I first saw it as a kid, it was amazing. You know, you've got Odd Job with the hat, I love Odd Job. That weird golf scene that goes on for ages. We could talk about all that, you know, and the Aston Martin and all the rest of it. But the real reason that Goldfinger's at number five is what we often forget about popular cinema, things like Carry On, things like Hammer Horror, they create their own style, right? And we often underrate that. We talk about the style of auteur directors and art films. We don't talk about the specific and original stylings of popular film. And in Goldfinger, that style of James Bond coheres. And, you, and, and it's really impressive. You know, you, you, it, it's got a genuine style and a house style of its own, right? Which really cements in this film. Let's not forget that Robert Bresson, of all people, loved this movie. It's one of those little bits of film history that serious cinephiles like to sort of brush under the carpet. Bresson liked a James Bond film. How embarrassing is that? But he did. He loved Goldfinger. And he loved it for a good reason. Stylistically, it's got its own idiosyncratic style and fashion and mode. And that really impresses me. Fourth place, Live and Let Die. Now, you see, I like Silly Bond. I like Roger Moore. I grew up with it. I love Live and Let Die. This was another movie that I used to long for as a child. It had all the elements that I loved, right? So it's got all the, the occult and tarot cards. You'll notice that I'm very much into tarot cards. It's, uh, it's got all those elements. I used to love the, the, the tall guy with the hat and the, the half black, half white face, you know, coming out of the grave and laughing. I loved all that voodoo stuff. I loved it. And I, and I love this movie. It's got, the villains are all great. The, the top villain is called Mr. Big. <laughs> great and he's got the guy with the claw and then there's the big fat guy who whispers and then they've got the, the the sort of voodoo guy you've got jane seymour who's a tarot card reader 
you know, in the scene where all the tarot cards are all the lovers and all that. This, you know, isn't this the one at the beginning where, um, is it this one where they, they, there's a funeral going through the streets and they're playing this slow blues jazz and then they kill the bloke, put him in the coffin and they all start dancing. That is such a great scene. Honestly, I could watch this movie endlessly. I think some people these days find it a bit offensive, a bit politically incorrect. Okay, I, I come from a different generation. I find it really amusing. Number three, On a Majesty's Secret Service. All Bond fans, even silly Bond fans like me, love this film. Because this is the sort of film where you get a deepening of the character of Bond and he, he genuinely falls in love with the woman. Let's be honest here. There's a lot that's crap in On a Majesty's Secret Service. George Lazenby isn't crap, he's okay, but he's not great. Telly Savalas is a bit boring as Blofeld. All that stuff up in the Shilthorn, that sort of restaurant on top of the... Um, mountain where it was filmed, where Blofeld has his base and where I've been to have a meal. It's a bit wanky, it's a bit silly. This film is made by Diana Rigg. She is the secret, you know, ingredient of this movie. And her interaction with Bond is what this movie is all about. And Diana Rigg is wonderful. And the ending is wonderful with Louis Armstrong. It's still the most memorable ending in any Bond film. And that's why it's at the top of so many people's lists and why it's, why it's at the top of mine. Also, the music uh, is very good. Um, and the skiing sequences. I love James Bond's skiing sequences. Bob sleighs, skis, cable cars, all that is great. Second place. Okay, here we go. This is the big one. Some people might switch off here. I'm going to go for it. Moonraker. I bloody love Moonraker. I love it so much. It is by far and away the silliest Bond, and it's one of the best. What is wrong with people? This is a blast. It's James Bond in the era of Star Wars trying to do sci-fi. A ludicrous idea, and I love it. I love that they did it. It features Michel Lonsdale. Now, Michel Lonsdale was a great French actor. He worked with Jacques Rivette. He didn't amazing number of roles. Here he's sort of slumming it as a Bond villain. I understand some people don't like Drax. Are you out of your minds? For instance, Drax has one of the best lines of any villain in the James Bond series when he goes, Mr Bond, your country's one contribution to world culture. Afternoon tea. <laughs> and he has that wonderful line, Mr Bond, I bid you farewell. I love, I love Michelle Lonsdale. He's absolutely wonderful. This movie tonally is all over the place. One minute it's making a joke about Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know, the do 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 in the wall. The next minute it's having some weird sequence where Roger Moore is in a gravity car. And he's, you know, that bit when the, the gravity is rustling up his face, which always frightened me as a kid. Then, he's, then he's, he's having a chat with Lewis Childs. Then there's the French uh, helicopter uh, pilot who's very lovely. And then you, you, you're above a chateau in the middle of the Californian countryside. There's this French chateau. And then there's this really odd kind of gothic sequence where a woman is chased through the forest by dogs and is killed by dogs. Really weird. Then you're in Venice and there's Jaws and he's got a girlfriend. It is bonkers. And all of this leads up to, you know, them going out to this space base, which is like something out of Star Wars or 2001. God help me, I could not love this film more. I love it to pieces. I know that a lot of Bond fans hate it with a purple passion. I adore it. I adore it. But number one, this film has crept up on me over the years, and I didn't realise it until I started thinking about this list. But this is my favourite Bond. And it's not one of the old 70s Bonds. It's not Connery, it's not Roger Moore. It's Daniel Craig, and it's Skyfall. And I absolutely love this film. And I think those people who do take Bond seriously, this is the movie that works best as a film. It's superbly directed, it's well written, brilliantly acted by a great cast. You've got Daniel Craig and Judi Dench doing really good work. Javier Bardem is excellent as the villain. And right at the end, just when you don't think it can get any better, Albert Finney turns up and goes, I've been waiting for this all my life. I mean, I love Albert Finney and that bit is great. That whole end sequence at Skyfall, Bond's home, beautifully shot and edited and done. I love the way that Judy Dench is making shrapnel bombs and Albert Finney is sawing off the shotgun. It's an absolutely exquisitely mounted sequence. My favourite 
sort of sequence in Bond, really. The whole movie is superb. It really is very good. And it's become my favourite. Uh, I think it's uh, the high point of Craig's time as Bond and the high point of James Bond itself, actually. Love it to pieces. And we haven't even mentioned the Adele song. Anyway, that's my ranking. I hope you've enjoyed that Christmas special going through James Bond. Let me know what your ranking is below. Let me know how much you hate Moonraker. Go on, let it all out. I love it. I'd love to hear from other Moonraker fans if there are any out there. Please let me know below. Anyway, have a great Christmas and a Happy New Year, and please like and subscribe. Thanks very much.